Hi, hello and uh, bonjour. I am uh, Dr. Ashish Babulkar. I'm the head of the Shoulder and Sports Injuries Department at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital, Pune. And with me, I have a unique guest. He's Anand Deshpande, and he's the founder of Persistent Systems, which is a large IT company, massive IT company with 12,000 employees, and he has more than 30 years experience. So Anand, welcome to this uh, interview. I know you work with many international cu customers. So <clears throat> do you also work with medical doctors and any healthcare specialists? Yes, uh, thank you Ashish for inviting me for this interview. And it's really fascinating to see what you've been working on with the <clears throat> HoloLens. Uh, at Persistent, we do a lot of work with healthcare and life sciences companies. Almost 25% of our business comes in this area. Uh, traditionally, we have worked with a large number of instrumentation companies, companies that make uh, various diagnostic equipment and also even the RT-PCR machines that are being used quite a bit in the market regarding COVID testing. Some of those, the software on that was built by our teams. We work with several hospitals, nearly about 100 of them in the US, mainly working on patient journeys and data management for hospitals and various kinds of medical data being saved and systems for that. Uh, our key customers include people like Mount Sinai or uh, Partners Healthcare and several other large hospital systems in the US. Um, so yes, we do work with a large number of hospitals and medical professionals and their uh, management of data and the software that they build for their mm -hmm. requirements. Mm -hmm. This uh, being used a lot in India, we, we don't have any Indian customers in the healthcare area as mm -hmm. much. Uh, how is the technology technology adoption in India, Ashish? And what, what do you see the uh, new technologies and how they get adopted in India? Right, Anand, um, there's a little bit of skew. If you look at the hospitals in the metropolitan areas or you look at the corporate hospitals, they are all techno savvy and they're up with it and they're all geared up. They have fax uh, systems which uh, are all inclusive, comprehensive, including all the investigations and the data keeping. And uh, unfortunately, the smaller hospitals or single loaned hospitals are unable to keep up because of either the costs or the challenges and technology is changing so rapidly. But there's also a lethargy uh, from our side because uh, they follow the American law where if it ain't broke, why fix it? But that has to change now rapidly because they are being challenged left and right on all sides. And that's why uh, data is the king right now and the devil is in the data as we understand. And uh, those who are full of data and are able to analyze the data and utilize it and uh, implement it, it's the application of data that is going to be key. But to start application of data, they must first start holding the data and uh, collecting the data, that is very critical. Like I know, Anand, that you work in the areas of database and data science. How has data technology evolved over the years? And do you think it is more relevant um, or is it more uh, relevant to the surgeons, medical practitioners? Yes, uh, see, data, data and data technology has evolved very significantly in the last few years. On the first end, we do now have the ability to save all kinds of complex objects, which is images, video, and various other kinds of things that you are looking at from various instruments, such as the MRI machine or several other machines that tend to be used a lot by medical professionals. Now, this data can be saved very nicely, and you can do a lot of analysis against that. The whole field of DNA sequencing and DNAs and RNA has really opened up a new, new opportunity for medical science and data science to work together. Plus, in the last few years, there's been a lot of advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Some of these techniques are now starting to become very relevant for medical science. I've been working on a couple of projects that may be of related value in this context. We've been working with a lot of cancer surgeons on how to manage cancer and genomics data and how to do correlations so that you can define what kind of diseases are to be treated in which form or the other. So these kinds of data collection is becoming very important because once you have data with you, 
you can do some very interesting correlations and analysis yeah. that can be very valuable for next generation of AI and research. Uh, do you see Absolutely. this as value in India? I Meaning, do you see people using data in a very effective way? Because after all, people say today that data is the next oil in some sense and is really valuable. How is this data getting leveraged by doctors and clinicians in India today? And do you use data a lot in your practice? Right, Alan, you actually nailed it right on the head because um, data is a gold mine. In my practice, I have every bit of data from my first day of uh, uh, consulting. And we have every data on every patient. So the first thing I tell my fellows is that you have to collect data because if you don't have data, then there is no analysis and then there is no research. So we have tons of data and uh, the hospitals we work into, they have a lot of storage capacity because there's huge data. Now, first step is to collect data and store it appropriately. And that has to be alphanumeric, it should be analytical. And once you have that, then you can mine the data and then you can use it for either machine learning or artificial intelligence. So now the HoloLens 2 project that we have been pursuing and doing it very successfully, uh, without the DICOM data from the CT scan images, which can be seamlessly acquired by the HoloLens 2 from the hospital systems, and then used it in a very safe manner without revealing any patient ID, and then applying that to surgery is going to be a huge advantage, which most of them have missed, unfortunately. And uh, the similar uh, characteristics uh, will be ap applicable to all branches of medicine because artificial intelligence uh, and mixed reality, once they merge together, there's opening a whole wide door of possibilities which will revolutionize patient health care. That's quite fascinating, Ashish. On the Microsoft HoloLens project, I can see the value that this provides surgeons. But how does the HoloLens project help patients and how useful is this for patients as such? Right. Um, the HoloLens 2 is a far advanced uh, design and its applications are multifold uh, for the fellows, for training, for overseas transmission. But from the patient point of view, we have uh, selectively applied it very effectively for shoulder replacement surgery. And so there have been modules and there have been uh, uh, algorithms built in by the French company to ensure that we can seamlessly transfer the holographic imaging to our surgery. So basically what we are getting is a 3D model right on my hand in the air while I'm operating. So we are used to seeing MRI scans and CT scans, which are actually uh, 2D representations of a 3D structure. And so minor flaws will creep in progressively. Now, even a five degree error in implantation of our prosthesis is going to result in an early loosening or poor result or suboptimal outcome measure. Now, if you can fine tune this and reduce that error to micromillimeters with the use of this technology, then it's going to mean that the patient is going to get much better functional outcomes. The processes will survive for a much longer time and we'll be able to do the surgery in minimal time without creating complications. It will reduce costs for the patient because hopefully it will reduce their revision rates. And so we are looking at a huge bounty of uh, results from the patient's point of view. That, that's very cool, Ashish. I know you are a top surgeon and a top shoulder surgeon in specifically in that area. What makes this device so useful for shoulder surgeons and uh, as compared to other common, say, hip replacement or knee replacement? Why is this so uniquely useful for a shoulder, shoulder surgeon like you? I think that's a very pertinent question, Anand, uh, because the hip and knee have an advantage of the shoulder because they are 50 years ahead on research and most of the problems have been sussed out. If you look at the designs of knee replacements, they are pretty similar across all different companies because nobody wants to tweak a successful model. It's a large joint, it is superficial, and errors are less likely. The shoulder is much more challenging because it has uh, three movable bones there. So there are a lot of errors. And the socket 
on the shoulder side, which is the glenoid, is just the dimension of a thumb. It's just 25 millimeters. So you can imagine a 2 mm error there is going to impact a significant level. So we think it's a 20% change in biomechanics on that patient's side. And the plate of bone behind that socket is so paper thin that if I have not drilled right in the center, that is going to compromise the results big time. So the revision rates on the shoulder are much higher than the hips. And so accuracy and perfect fit are a need of the hour for the shoulder side. So that is what makes shoulder much more challenging for. Very cool. Uh, very cool, Ashish. Really fascinating. Are you seeing any other applications of the HoloLens and uh, these kinds of technologies in surgery and shoulder surgery specifically? So what's beyond That's right, Anand. Hmm. So what has happened is there are several streams of applications in joint replacement surgery. On the one hand, you've got uh, uh, the robotics coming in. On the other end, you've got navigation technology to make your implantation more accurate. And you have this holographic uh, technique technology from HoloLens too. And in future, once these technologies mature and then they can be integrated it's going to be like a dream come true. It's like one of those, you know, landing on Mars and living on Mars kind of uh, effect. So that's the closest analogy I can share with you. And which is revolutionary. And not only that, it will disrupt everything in shoulders. So I'm damn excited about the introduction of HoloLens. And slowly I can see that this is your first step towards a much larger footprint in the history of shoulder replacements. That's very, very impressive. I can see the excitement that you have about the HoloLens and the technology landscape moving forward. As you realize, you know, most of us in India specifically, the biology people or the medical doctors work separately from engineers. Uh, is there a way we could be working together much more closely? I think there may be some opportunities for leveraging technology in medicine. And perhaps we need to think a little broad, broadly as compared to what we are doing today. What's your thoughts on it? And is there something we can do differently? I know, Anand, we've discussed this uh, issue in the past. And I know you just stole my thunder because I was going to throw this question right at you. Because as a person who deals with technology all the time, and you are up there at the top level on technology, and being a graduate from IIT, um, it is very important that we understand how to merge these two streams. Unfortunately, yes. they're working in two independent silos. You've got medicine and technology on one end and your cutting edge technology on the other end. So our doctors are very poor at application of technology and imbibing it. I want you to share and bring us together to a common platform so that we can research and multiply these gains. Do you have any ideas on that side? Yeah, I think I've been thinking about this for a while. Actually, I'm quite fascinated by biology and genomics at the moment. So I've been reading up quite a bit about some of these areas. And one of the things is I've been on the boards of a few universities and engineering colleges. And one of the things that we are trying very hard to see how to collaborate between engineering colleges and engineering education and medical sciences and see if we can do common courses together. I think some of these techniques around machine learning, artificial intelligence and others can be really done very effectively if you have a lot of very good quality data that is being used together for solving next generation problems. And for that, it is important that both people who have domain expertise in the specialized fields such as surgery and medicine mm. um, must understand enough data science and technology. And more importantly, the tech people need to understand how basic biology or mechanics yes. or some of the stuff you do works together. So I think this is a very nice uh, initiative that you started by inviting me to this session. I think we should use this as a starting point for working together on some important problems together. So thank you very much for inviting me. Lovely. I think that's a fantastic cue and I'm going to take that up seriously because I've got you now on record that you are agreeing to collaborate. We are going to really bargain for your busy time. I will contribute mine as well. Now, uh, let's discover how the surgery went in India. So wait and watch for the surgery that follows here. Thank Looking you very much. Looking forward to it. Exciting. Cheers. Thank you.